Ja, Välkommen till this uh, program with the title Daniel chapter 11 verses 40 to 45. And this is about how the papacy will fall into the glorious land. Let us have a little prayer before we start this program. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, uh, when we shall start this program, we pray that you must be with us and uh, we shall go through some uh, few verses in the Old Testament in Daniel 11, chapter 11, verse 40 to 45. And we know that this is difficult words, but it tells us in sh the short terms what will happen in the last time so we want to know what you want to tell us in Jesus name we pray Amen <clears throat> well I must admit that uh, these verses here from uh, Daniel 11 40 to 45 can be difficult but uh, even though we will try to uh, to um, uh, tell you what we have found out of this uh, few verses. I know it's uh, much discussion in uh, many uh, different people they have uh, different opinions of these uh, few verses uh, but I hope you will find that uh, 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 I, I hope you will learn something from this program that can, that can be useful for you and me. We, the first the text is uh, then like this and at the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him, push at the king of the north. First of all we want to find out what is this about at the time of the end, the end time, then this will happen. What is the Bible saying about the end time, the time of the end? And we have several uh, uh, verses in Bible. I think it's about seven places where it's standing about this uh, 1260 days. That is, uh, yes, we have this both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. And this the end of this 12, 1260 days will, will then uh, the end time and the time of the end will start then when this prophecy is ended. And we want to find out how shall we understand this prophecy about the 1260 days or 22 months. And then um, uh, as on this uh, picture you will see that this uh, prophecy is uh, going from 538 to 798. Uh, that is the time when the papacy reigned in the Middle Ages. And, uh, but then we also must understand that when it's about time prophecy, then the Bible is saying that we always shall use one day for one year. So this is this period is about 1260 years. And that fits very well that the time when the papacy had this power from 538 AD to 798 AD. And then in the last part of this prophecy then the time of the end will start. So um, we have also here a text from Ezekiel 4.6 uh, where, where we read that I have appointed thee each day for a year. So that means that always when we have time prophecies we shall count one day for one year. So one prophetic day is one literal year. And this is like this, so 1260 days, it is 1260 years in time prophecy in the Bible. 
So then the time of the end will begin in the last part of this prophecy in 1798. And then what happened around this time? Um, then we read that at the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him, push at the king of the north. And then we will find out who is the king of the south. And um, uh, then what happened uh, around 1798? Because then the time of the end should start. Well, then we had the French Revolution from 1789 to 1793. And we shall take, go into some points here what happened in the French Revolution. And point one, they abolished, they abolished the government voted by the people. Two, Robert Spierre, the leader of the Jacobins, and his people established his own and legal government. Robespierre was the leader of this Jacobin club, and this is a kind of a secret organization like Freemasons or something like this. So Robespierre, he was a leader, and he abolished um, the legal government and establish his own legal government of his men. Point three, they burned the Bibles on the streets. Four, the week should consist of 10 days. Point five, they killed the people that worshiped God. Point six, they did not respect or believe in God. They turned away from God. And this is Atheism, the king of the salt. And we have one text here from the Old Testament, from Exodus 5, verses 1 to 2, that also tells a little about atheism. We read, Afterward, Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, Thus say the Lord God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. And Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord, that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, nor will I let Israel go. So, the people that prefer atheism, they do not believe in God, and they do not want to follow God. And that was the position in the French Revolution, they established this illegal government of people that not believed in God. And we have seen in these points what happened. And then we read further on in this text from Daniel 11, 14. And at the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him, push at the king of the north. And now we will look a little more into this because in that time it was Napoleon that reigned in France. And he sent a um, um, war company to the Vatican, to Rome, and under the leading leader of General Berthier. And then we read from, um, from the history books. In 1798, he, General Berthier, made his entrance into Rome abolished the papal government and established a secular one. In this next picture we see a picture of General Haller. He was also a general uh, of, um, uh, under Napoleon. He arrested Pope Pius VI on February 1798. And um, here we have a picture of uh, this um, Cariol horse wagon that took the um, uh, Pope uh, uh, Pius VI to France, where he died uh, on a castle. And uh, here on this uh, picture we also see uh, um, a copy of this newspaper in Italy uh, on uh, Rome 
It's standing on the bottom there, Rome 15, February 1798. And here they uh, is writing about this fact that uh, uh, the soldiers of um, Napoleon, they came, came and take this Pope Pius VI captive and took him to France where he later on died. And then this, um, this uh, atheistic movement in France, uh, it came also to Russia. And uh, we read about the Russian Revolution and atheism. Atheistic Communist Soviet Russia was established about 1917. Surely, when the Soviet Union established herself as an atheistic world power, she very clearly qualified herself to be a successor to atheistic Egypt and atheistic France. She grew into an atheistic and atheistic superpower. And now we shall look a little on the parallels between the French and the Russian Revolution, because these parallels are very striking. And we will take these six points. Point one, both revolutions were based on communist writings of Voltaire and Mar Marx. Two, both revolutions persecuted Bible-believing Christians. Point three, both revolutions ended the monarchies. Point four, both revolutions declared atheis atheism as the religion of the state. And point five, both revolutions carried out a reign of terror by the inquisitional, inquisitional secret police. And point six, both revolutions resulted in military dictators who punished their enemies. So both in France and in Russia, uh, communism were established. And then we continue to read in this text in Daniel 1140 And the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind, with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships, and he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. So then, who was the king of the south? whom the papacy would attack, attack like a whirlwind, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt? The answer is the atheistic power of the Soviet Union. And on this picture you can see the President of the United States, Ronald Reagan, uh, together with Pope John Paul II. And uh, they are discussing how to break down communism and establish a new world order. And if you can look a little on these faces, you can see the Pope. He is uh, like uh, a smart, clever and tricky uh, man. And uh, he won victory in this conversation because Ronald Reagan, he accepted his plan. And uh, the first step was to break down uh, the boundaries between uh, countries and then to establish a new world order with international laws instead of national laws. And on this picture you can see uh, the first step after, they, after Gorbachev and John Paul II had, they, had their conversations uh, uh, was to break down the wall between East and West Germany. And this happened in 1989. And in the same year, in the end of 1989, uh, that was actually in 1990, the year after, then Gorbachev, the leader of the Soviet Union, um, Russia, uh, he uh, resigned on December 31, 1990. And uh, he then said that they should end uh, communism and they should start a new strategy in the world. 
And this was a silent revolution as you see on these next pictures. Um, and uh, it was after when the people in Soviet Russia they uh, and they heard this message that communism should be um, uh, sh they should stop communism and Gorbachev should should resign then all the people they very many people they rejoiced and they came out on the street and they filled the red square in Moscow as you see on these uh, pictures and on the next picture you can see that the statues of the of, of these leaders in Soviet Union, as uh, Stalin and uh, many of the other leaders, they took down these statues, and um, the people they rejoiced. With the speed of a world wind, atheistic Russia and her satellites were broken. That very word, world wind as stated in the Bible, was used over and over by various news reporters as they related the swiftness of the breakdown of communism in Eastern Europe. And you can see on these faces of the people, they really were so glad, they rejoiced, they clapped in their hands, and they thought that no, we shall have a better country to live in. And I think that it has been a better country. I have myself been in Russia, in, uh, in Murmansk, in Montegolsk and in Moscow. And I, as I have to spoken with the people there, I think that they, they think they have be got a better, uh, better time in Russia. And just after Gorbachev has resigned, he went to the Vatican, to the Pope, to, uh, uh, to celebrate the first steps toward the new world order. And then we shall continue in the last part of, um, or in, now we are coming to a new verse, verse 41, Daniel 11, 41. He shall also enter into the glorious land and many countries shall be overthrown. This he that is the king of the north, and we have revealed this as the papacy. He will also enter into the glorious land, and many, we have this word countries, that is in italic, and this is added to the text. It does not stand in the ground text, but they have, they have written this word because I think that this is right, but it is not in the ground text. So many, not many countries, because some people they think that it shall be this, but many shall be overthrown. You see, many people they think that countries, many countries, that really is also to, they think that the glorious land is the United States of America. But now we will look at this, what is meant with the glorious land. Because the papacy will enter also into the glorious land and many people shall be overthrown. Now follows the Aram, Aramic, Aramic Peshitta Bible, the Textus Receptus, or the received text from which our authorized version is translated and we read in this text. He shall reach also the land of Israel, and many people, not many countries, shall be slain. But these shall be delivered out of his hand, even Edom, Moab, and the remnant of the children of Ammon. So the King James Version refers to the glorious land as the ancient Israel. In pre-apostolic times, as we can read it in verse 16. Then who is Israel or God's people in the end time? In verse, 30, in verse 41. That is the question. Who is God's people or Israel today? That is an even better question. Because now we are in the end time. And then we will find out who is Israel in the end time. 
And then we will start with a text from Christ. Uh, and this is from Matthew uh, 23, verse 37 to 38. Jesus said, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together, as a hen gathered her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. So the people, they were not willing to accept Christ as the Savior. They killed the prophets that told about the Savior that should come. And when the prophet, when Christ came, the Savior, when he came, they were not willing to accept him as the Savior of the world. Christ said, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing and it is marvelous in you in our eyes. Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it. So it is obvious that Israel did not bear the fruits of the Spirit. And because they should, they, they, it, that was the work that they should bear the fruit of the Spirit. They should represent Christ as, as Christ's chosen people. But they, Christ say had, they rejected him. They rejected the cornerstone. That is Christ. And then Christ took this conclusion. Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you. And when the kingdom of God will be taken from Israel, who will then Christ give the, his kingdom to? And he said it himself, I will give it to thy nation bearing the fruits of the Spirit. So, um, in the New Testament, in our times, from the words of Christ, Israel as a nation are not the glorious land in the New Testament. That is the people that is bearing the fruit of the Spirit. Because he wanted to give his kingdom to a people that were willing to bear the fruits of the Spirit. And Paul is writing in Ephesians 2.14 For he himself is our peace, who has made both one, and has broken down the middle wall of separation. So it is Christ that has broken down the middle wall between that separated the heathen from the Jews. No, when Christ has broken down this, we are equal. We are one in Christ. And Paul, uh, no, Paul continue in Galatians 3, 7. Therefore know that only those who are of faith our sons of Abraham. Think about this. And we continue in Galatians, Galatians 3. For you are all sons of God. Through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many as you as were baptized into Christ. Have put on Christ. Therefore there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male or female. So, Christ is saying very clear that we have to have faith in Christ. If we not believe in Him and have faith in Him, we are not His people. So, in this text we read, there is neither Jew or Greek. No, we are one in Christ when we have faith in Him. And we continue in this text. You are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heir according to the promise. And many, many people 
they will not accept this text because still they think that Israel has a first place to come to be a God's chosen people today. But from the Bible, from the text we have read now, we have read that we are all one in Christ. So we are on the same level. So if we are in Christ, then we are Abraham's seed and here according to the promise. Are you willing to accept this, this uh, text and this message that today the spirit of Israel is the people that have faith in him and we are all one in him? So that means that God's people are scattered around in the world in different parts of the world. All that have faith in him, willing to follow him, they are one in him. We continue to read in Romans 2 and in this text Paul is saying what is a real Jew. For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit, nor in the letter whose praise is not from the man, but from God. So when we have accepted Christ as our Savior, an inwardly change, then we are His children. We continue to read from Romans 9, 8. That is, those who are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as the sea. So it is not, the important thing is not if we have the blood of Abraham, but if we have the faith of Abraham, if we have the faith of Christ, then we are his chosen people today. Then we are his spiritual Israel today. And the papacy will then move into the spiritual Israel, the glorious land, God's people in the end time. In John 3.16 we read, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That is the spiritual Israel. And in Galatians 5.24 And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. This is the spiritual Israel. Therefore if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. This is the spiritual Israel. My sheep hear my voice, Jesus is saying, and I know them, and they follow me. This is the spiritual Israel. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. This is the spiritual Israel. If you love me, keep my commandments. This is, Christ is saying this. And if you love Christ and keep his commandments, then you are the spiritual Israel. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. This is the spiritual Israel. So today, God's glorious land, His church, is worldwide. It is all people that have accepted him in faith and all these people are one in Christ, scattered all over the world. And then we read that the papacy shall enter into the glorious land and many shall be overthrown. And that's a sad fact, but the Bible does not lie. So this will happen in these days, because we are in the end time. 
So many of God's people will be deceived because the papacy will infiltrate the church of God and come fall into the church of God. In Ezekiel chapter 8, we see that this will happen like this. In a hole in the wall of the temple, Ezekiel saw the abominations, the apostasy in the church of God. And today, we have seen this apostasy coming into the church of God through celebration, pop music, rock music, drama, theater, miming. This is coming from the world into the church, sweeping into the church gradually. And today they think that this is okay. Competition games in how shall we if we hold, if we uh, if we are doing competition games where is our thoughts are they to God or are they to the ball or whatever you are doing this is the preparation time where our thoughts shall be fixed on God and His will to do His will so we all in all things can be in harmony with Him. New theology is coming in, an easy way of being saved. Makeup, new fashion with rings in the skin, lipsticks, skin powder, colored hair, mini shirts, short tunics. People are more occupied with outwardly beauty than the beauty that shall come from inside and shall be shown in our character. That is the beauty of God's people. We see ecumenism. These uh, um, churches are going together under the umbrella of the papacy. The Sabbath will be lightly regarded and many Sabbath keeping people will even accept Sunday worship. So many will fall, unfortunately. Many will fall. And this is being fulfilled today. And more will come. In Isaiah chapter 58 verse 1 we read. Cry aloud. Spare not. Lift up thy voice like a trumpet. And show my people thy transgression. And the host of Jacob their sins. So we have to give the trumpet a clear sound because we want to help the people to be saved into the kingdom of God because they cannot be saved into the kingdom of God if they follow the world. And even though they are in the church, that cannot save them. If they have taken the world into the ch church and they are living together with this style, this is not good enough. Show my people their transgressions. We have been called of Christ to do this work. Even though people they will try to stop us. And keep our mouth. You must sh stop. But uh, we have to be loyal to God. Because we want to help people. To see that they are on the broad road. Toward hell. And we must come into the small road that is going to life. We continue in Ezekiel 9, 4. And the Lord said to him, Set a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh and cry over all the abominations that are done within the church. So, if you, if you want to be silent... If you don't want to, to reveal the apostasy in the church, just to try to, to, to help people to understand that they are on the wrong road, track, if you not will sigh and cry about the abominations that is being done in the church, then uh, I think you are on dangerous ground. 
because the Bible is saying that the people that sigh and cry about these abominations, they will be accepted by God. They will have His seal and they will not take the mark of the beast. Some people they think that the church will be perfect in the last time. So you have to stay in the church if you shall be saved. But if it, it, if it should be like this, why then should the people sigh and cry for all the abominations that are in the church? Even the Bible saying that it will be tears and wheat and they will stay together. So, but if we, not, if we are tears, then we cannot be saved. So we have to change. We have to come out of this situation and fully follow Christ. Today, many of God's people are already being overthrown. And many more will be overthrown or spiritually slain in the near future. The greatest goal of the King of the North is to overthrow the Church of God, which has a Bible-based message, the three angels' message from Revelation chapter 14, verses 6 to 10. Read these verses for yourself and you will see what is the message for this time. So the battle, the war, the spiritual battle, the spiritual war is between the king of the north and the people of the glorious land, God's people. And fortunately, not all will be overthrown. But many will be overthrown. Sad to say, but that's what the Bible is saying. And we can ask this, this question, can we see this is being, this happened today? Yes, we can see this. And more will come. More apostasy will come. And more people will be overthrown. The papacy is on move into God's church. And we have to realize this. The, B the Bible reveals it. And we must be on guard. And pray that God, that He must help us to understand what is going on. And we and pray for His Spirit, so we can get the power to follow Christ and not the world. We continue to read in Daniel 11:41. But these shall escape out of His hand, even Edom and Moab and the chief of the children of Ammon. So then is the question, who is represented by Edom and Moab and the chief of the children of Ammon? In Isaiah chapter 11 verse 10 to 14, there we read about an end time prophecy just as in Daniel 11, 41. Both speak of Edom, Moab and Ammon. Isaiah refers to them as those obedient ones who are rescued by the hands of God's missionaries. In the book of Daniel, they are referred to as those who escape out of the hand of the king of the north. So these three, Edom, Moab and Am 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 Ammon, they will, um, they will be, they will they will listen to the message, the, this end time message, in the last time of world history. And they will accept this message. And they will escape out of the hands of the papacy, of the king of the north. And this converted people of Edom and Moab and Ammon will themselves be active witnesses. They will go to, they will go to the world and preach the three angels message. The last message of grace and warning to the word, and we can shout, Hallelujah! Praise the Lord for these people that they are there, they are in Babylon, but when they hear the call and they hear the message to come out of Babylon, they will accept this and they will stand on God's side fully. And then we come to the next 
two verses. Daniel 11, 42-43 He shall stretch forth his hand also upon the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. But he shall have power over the treasures of gold and of silver, and over all the precious things of Egypt. And the Libyans and the Ethiopians shall be at his steps. So the papacy will stretch out his hands to other nations. And we have seen in the last years, and especially through this Pope John Paul II, he traveled around in the world and stretched out his hands to other countries and established dip diplomatic um, ties with nearly all countries in the world. And people rejoiced. They loved this man. And now here we have this um, new Pope, uh, uh, um, Franz, Pope Franz. And uh, when we saw he, when we saw when he was elected, uh, and he came forward uh, there on the balcony in in the Vatican. People they rejoiced and they clapped in their hands. And, uh, they they shouted to him. But then the reporter, in uh, when we listened to this in Norway, the reporter said that this new pope he was a Jesuit. And then many people, they wonder, what is a Jesuit? And we have revealed this Jesuits in another program that is called uh, something like uh, uh, Pope France in the Vatican, a Jesuit. And I will just read a little passage in this Oath of the Jesuits. I will do my utmost, we read in this, in this Oath. I will do my utmost to extirpate the heretical Protestant or liberal doctrines and to destroy all the pretended powers, legal or otherwise. That is an oath that this new Pope has given when he entered this Jesuits work, the work of the Jesuits. And the Jesuits is the soldiers of the Catholic Church. And they will they will ruin the Protestantism and the independent countries, as we read in this text here. So he will stretch out this Pope Franz and the other popes that have been before him. They stretch out their hands toward other countries through the New World Order, through the European Union through the African Union, through the United Nations, through the United States of America, through the international laws, through the media. He is using or working through these institutions in order to establish the new world order. So he tried to establish a new world order, a new order in the world. And he cannot do this alone, but he used these institutions so they can help him to establish this new world order. And here we have a Tower of Babel. Nimrod tried to, to gather all the people in this, around this centralized uh, system. And you can see the parallel between this and the EU Parliament in Strasbourg. It's nearly as a new... Uh, babe, Tower of Babel. And it is, also, it is also interesting to see this Vatican coin. They had 12 stars just as in the um, Vatican or, or the European Union's flag. And um, uh, in that way you, you can see that they have the same symbol. And this, they have this uh, these uh, 12 stars from um, Revelation chapter 12, where it's standing about uh, uh, this, uh, uh, we can read this text here perhaps. Uh, now a great sign appear in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, uh, with the moon under her feet, and on her head 
um, garland of 12 stars. So they think that this 12, this, uh, this woman is uh, the Catholic Church and these 12 stars is a picture of Mary. So uh, then you understand which powers are behind uh, the, uh, this uh, European uh, Union. And all, all these bills, these uh, uh, money bills, they have a picture of a bridge. Because, you know, the, pe the Pope has a title Pontifex Maximus. And that means that he is the greatest bri bridge builder. So, in the European Union, they try to bridge, to be bridge builders. To unite the countries uh, um, under... Uh, the European Union. They also try to be bridge builders, the Catholic Church, through the ecumenical movement. And here you have a picture of this Pontifex Maximus. Uh, they think that this is a Pope, but we know that the greatest bridge builder is not the Pope, but it is Christ. It is only He that can save us. He is the ladder between this earth and the heaven. And we, we cannot... He is saying himself, I am the way, the truth and the life. And no one can come to heaven um, um, only through me. But the Pope, as on this picture, he thinks that he is uh, the uh, Pontifex Maximus, the leader in the earth and uh, under the earth and in heaven. The crown here is divided in three. And here is uh, another picture of this Pontifex Maximus, uh, John Paul II. And as I told you, they also try to bridge, to build bridge, bridges through the ecumenical movement in the religious area or ground. And on this picture, uh, in one of the chambers in uh, Brussels, where they sign. Uh, new EU laws and treaties. You can see a, a big statue of the Pope uh, that is uh, stretching out his hands and bless the signing they are doing there in Brussels. It's telling very much which powers are behind these uh, institutions. And an article in the new um, uh, Lisbon Treaty, uh, we uh, have a um, um, additional paragraph from the tract on the functioning of the European Union, Article 27, and we read in this Article 27, the constitution and law by the institutions of the Union shall have primacy over the laws, law of the Member States. And a European law shall be binding in its entirety and directly applic applicable in all Member States. So the law and the constitution in the European Union shall have primacy over the law of the member states. That means that these countries, the member countries, they are occupied by this European Union. They have nothing to say, they have to follow their laws, they have to follow their guidelines, and they have to, 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 uh, to follow this in their own countries. Here is a picture of Adolf Hitler. He was a leader of Germany from 1933 to 1945. And uh, you can see on this, uh, on this symbol he has on his breast there, it's a Catholic symbol because he was a Catholic. And he also tried to ruin Protestantism and the independent countries, just as we read in the Oath of the Jesuits. And uh, you see this symbol here is, a comment, is coming from the Malti, it's a Malti cross. And this, uh, th this is a, a secret organization, a very special organization of the Catholic Church. And on this next picture we can see the same symbols on these leaders of Hitler. They were Catholics and they were even, some of them were even Jesuits. And we know that they used the power, and if you not follow their guidelines, you have to be killed. 
So you see, it's the same powers that are coming back again through the European Union. The Catholic Church want to regain the power uh, through um, their men in the in the in the European Union, and it is Catholics that have started this movement, um, as Konrad Adenauer, Alcide de Gasparri, Jean Monnet, and so on. All these were Catholics. And all the leaders in the European Union have been Catholics. And the first one, Jacques the Lord, he was even a Jesuit. And the two latest leaders are Jesuit. Jose uh, Barroso, uh, uh, Jose Manuel Barroso, and this uh, Hermann von Rompuy. They are both Jesuits. And we know that this uh, Hermann von Rompuy, uh, this new leader, he said, when he talked about who, uh, who formed the European Union, the laws in the European Union, he said, we are all Jesuits. So the aim when the papacy is stretching out his hands to other countries, that is because he wants to have a grip on them. He wants that they shall follow their laws and their guidelines. They are working for the new world order. And we have this text also from Revelation 17, 12. And the ten horns which thou sowest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. So all these world powers that will go together under the umbrella of the Catholic Church. And they, the Bible is saying in verse 14 in chapter 17, they are working against Christ and the people that are standing on Christ's side. So in this short text here, we see the battle and who, which stand we shall take in this battle. Pope Leo XIII sent out a new uh, apostolic letter in 1890 and in this apostolic letter we read all Catholics must make themselves felt as active elements in the daily political life in the countries where they live. All Catholics should exert their power to cause the constitution of the states to be model, modeled on the true church. And today we see that they change constitutions so they shall be mole, modeled to the principles of the Catholic Church. We see also this Lisbon Treaty in the European Union. It's a model of the principles of the Catholic Church. And in Auro Manhattan, he wrote a, a book called The Vatican Billions. And in this, he, among others, he wrote in Europe, the main goal of the Jesuits is the influencing of the mass media. So they use the mass media to give their information to the people. And now they try to monopolize the newspapers in Europe and the TV stations. So, and it is very interesting, this statement from Paul, Pope Paul the Sixth from 1964, where he is saying, It is the church birthright to use and own the press, the cinema, radio, radio and television stations and others of like nature. So the Catholic Church is using the media. She is saying that it is the birthright of the Catholic Church to own and to use this, all these media stations. And today they have a great influence of the biggest media stations in the world. And through them they can propagand, give this propaganda for a new world order. And the people that are speaking against this system, they try to put, a, to put a bind around their mouth so they not can speak. 
and uh, the people that are talking about this system, they will have problems in the future. So, um, but even though we are just not talking, uh, speaking against this, because we think uh, we think by ourselves this is not good, but the Bible is clearly saying that these world powers will work together with the Vatican in the last part of this world history. Revelation chapters 13 to 18, read these verses and you will see it for yourself. So the papacy will stretch out his hands, I will repeat this again, upon other countries through the new world order, through the European Union, through the African Union, through the United Nations, through the United States of America, through the international laws, through the media, and we could continue and continue. They use all these institutions to, to, uh, to uh, bring out a, a global uh, strategy, to, to, to bind all these uh, stage all these nations together under thy uh, umbrella. And then we continue with this verse 42 and 43. But he shall have power over the treasures of gold and of silver, and over all the precious things of Egypt, and the Libyans and the Ethiopians shall be at his steps. And in this little part we will, we will deal with this a text, but he shall have power over the treasures of gold and of silver, and over all the precious things of Egypt. In chapter 17, here in the Revelation, book chapter 17, we read about the harlot. Uh, and this harlot, he, he, um, he is uh, he's deceiving the nations and the kings on this earth. The harlot of Revelation 17 is arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with color and precious stones and pearls. So here we see in this text that the Vatican, they have the gold and the silver. They have the money. And on the next pictures you will see some of this. If you go into some of the churches of the Catholic Church, you can see all this gold and silver and precious things that the Bible is talking about. And people, they are astonished of all this riches, richness that you find in the Catholic Church. It's pictures uh, that is so valuable that uh, it is very special. You can see all these pictures. I have, if we should have all this wealth, then uh, I think it will be much better to give to the poor people. But they have this power for themselves. And they are being rich of others because they have given money to them. And they build up their system so people can think that, oh, this is a great church. This is a great rich church. Oh, they must be the, 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 the people of God. But you see, God, he will use humble instruments that wants to, you know, for example, the, the, the John the Baptist, he was very simple cloth, but he was filled with the Holy Spirit. So he was used to God in that way. Um, I will also say a little about Rothschild, because Rothschild is uh, the financial partner of the Vatican. They own the Bank of England in Germany, Austria, and also the Federal Reserve System in the United States of America, and much, much more. And it is also interesting that the international banks is a part of the New World Order. Then through this centralized system, they can influence the local banks. So the strategy is smart to have control over the money and have control over the banks. They also will make a centralized system also there. We read, continue to read from Revelation 17 and 18. The merchants of these things which were made rich by her 
shall stand afar off for fear of the torment, weeping and wailing and saying, Alas, Alas, the great city that was clothed in fine line linen and purple and scarlet and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. For in one hour so great riches is come to naught. So here we see the great economic collapse that will come in the last part of this world history. The Catholic Church, they think they have all this money and all this gold and silver and they think that they are sitting very well and nothing, it can, no, they, 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 they think they have enough money. But the Bible is saying that at least all their money will be finished in one hour. That means the ground text here is horror and that means in a short time it will come an economic collapse. And we sense already this economic collapse today. And soon it will be a reality. And then all things will happen in the world. And the last movements will be rapid ones. And then we take the last part of this verse 43 in Daniel 11. And the Libyans and the Ethiopians shall be at his steps. Who is symbolized by the Libyans and the Ethiopians? We read from Jeremiah chapter 46 verse 9. Come up ye horses and rage ye chariots and let the mighty men come forth, the Ethiopians and the Libyans, and handle the shield and the Libyans that handle and bend the bow. Here, Libyans and Ethiopians is represented by the war powers. And the Bible is saying here in this verse that the Libyans, the war powers, will be at his steps, will be in the hands of the papacy in the last part of world history. And uh, it is in this connection very interesting that uh, the... Um, the European Union that uh, is led by Catholics. Uh, they, uh, this is the pulpit of the of the uh, of the papacy, uh, if we can say it in that way, in in Europe. Um, they, the the Vatican's men is ruling there in the European Union, and they they try to regain control in Europe through these institutions. And they have the war powers in their hands. We read that the war powers will be in the hands of the papacy in the last part. And this is also true in the European Union. We read from this reform treaty about the war powers. Member states shall actively and unreservedly support the Union's common foreign and security policy in a spirit of loyalty and mutual solidarity and shall comply with the Union's action in this area. They shall refrain from actions contrary to the Union's interests or likely to impair its effectiveness. So here see, we see that the member countries that give the a contribution to these war powers. These this soldiers in this European Union war, uh, what do you call it? A war uh, uh, company. <laughs> they shall be loyal and they shall give their solidarity to this, uh, to this war power. So um, so in that way, the European Union and their leaders, these Catholic leaders, they have a grip, they have a hand on the weapons in the European Union. And it is also interesting that in the United States, we also find the leaders of this war department, the defense department, he is a Catholic. His name is Chuck Hagel, and he has also his finger on the weapons 
in the United States. The war power shall be in the hands of the papacy in the end time. We see that this is being fulfilled today. More and more. Then we go to the next verse. Verse 44. Daniel 11, 44. The tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. Why, why north and east? Why shall these tidings come from north and east? These tidings that will trouble the papacy. We read from Isaiah 14, verse 13 and 14. Lucifer said in his heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mouth of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Here we see in this text that God's throne is in the sides of the north. We can also read this from Psalms 48 and verse 1 and 2. So this message is coming from the throne of God, from God. And this message that will be given in this last time that will, that will trouble the papacy will also come from the east. Why from east? We read from Matthew 24, 27. For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. And in Revelation 7, 2. And I saw another angel ascend from the east, having the seal of the living God. So we must take a con we have to take a conclusion of this text. Christ and his mighty angel, angel is coming from east. So this message from north and east is coming from God. And then in the last part of verse 44 we read the tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. So this tiding, these tidings, this message that shall be given that will trouble the papacy, what is this? Yes, we have this message, this last message that will be given to this world. We have this in Revelation chapter 14 and from verse 6 to 12. And we will read this passage now. And I saw another angel. An angel is a symbol of a messenger. The ground text of this is angelus and that's, that means a messenger. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of the heaven having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him, worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountain of waters. And then we have the next the second angel's message that shall be given to by the messengers of God. And there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the breath of her fornication. And then we go to the last message. And the third angel followed them saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, then it will not go so well. So this is the three angels' messages that will be given to the world in the last time of this world history. This is a message of grace, and this is a message of warning. A warning that we not shall accept the false teaching of the papacy and the fallen Protestant churches. We, it is also a warning about to take the mark of the beast. 
And this is all these three messages is a worldwide proclamation of the gospel that will be given to all the world. And today this message is given in different uh, uh, parts of the world. We can see that light is, is shining here and the light is shining there. And of course this is a beginning but more will come. God will take the reins in his all in his own hands and he will fulfill so this message can be given to the world. Despite of the spiritual darkness and the separation from God which exist in the Catholic Church and the fallen Protestant churches, the majority of the true followers of Christ are still in their communities. The appeal sounds like this Come out of her, my people. So most of God's people are in Babylon. And when they hear this message that revealed apostasy in the Catholic Church and the fallen Protestant churches, and they see the message here from God, from the Bible, then they will listen, they will accept, they will see that they have taken they have listened to a wrong message and they will accept the message from God, from the Bible, this last message of grace and warning. And they will come out of Babylon because they will not take part in this apostasy. So, the most of God's people are in Babylon. I think we have met some of these people and they have been deceived. And when they see the truth from the Bible, they accept it with all their hearts and they turn around and follow Christ fully. Many children of God are still found in Babylon when they hear the three angels' message proclaimed and then understand the unbiblical teaching of the Catholic Church and fallen Protestantism. Then they will take to heart the call of the angel, Babylon is fallen and come out of her, my people. And they will finally leave the apostate churches. Therefore, he shall go forth with great fury and destroy and utterly to make away many. That is talking about the king of the north, the papacy. He will go forth in great fury to destroy the people that are giving this message. Because this message tells the people which way they shall go. They have to follow Christ fully and his, his way is not the same as you find in the preaching of the Catholic Church and the fallen Protestant churches. And this message about the apostasy that they, not, that, they, that they not shall take the mark of the beast. This message will also, they will understand the meaning of this and they, you know, I must say perhaps a little about this, because a beast, we have taken this in many, many other programs, but all the signs of the beast points to the papacy. And the papacy says very clear that because they have changed the day of rest from Sabbath to Sunday, this is a mark of their authority, they say. But they have been their own authority and they have changed the day of rest. You can read about this when you read from um, uh, Exodus uh, chapter 20 verses 3 to 17 and especially from verse 8 to 11. There you have the Sabbath commandment. And the Sabbath commandment, you know, God created the world in six days and he rested on the seventh. And God blessed this day and uh, he sanctified it. Um, then we read in Revelation 13 15, we read about which part uh, the United States will play in this, in, this, in this work to introduce the image of the beast and the mark of the beast. And we read, he, the United States of America, was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast. That the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. 
we revealed earlier in this program how the papacy will stretch out its hands to other nations, institutions, and if the papacy will use other institutions to to fill, fulfill their goals. And here they will use the United States. They will work together with the Vatican in the last days in order to introduce the mark of the beast. And we read here from the Bible that he was the United States was granted power to give, give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should not speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. So that is when the papacy will go out in fury to punish these people. We read here in this text that they will be an order to arrest and to kill the people that not will accept the mark of the beast. The mark of the beast, the false Sunday keeping, is when they introduce this by law. Many people today, they keep Sunday holy, but they do not understand that this is wrong. But when this message is coming out with clear voice, then people will see that it is, they have taken a wrong conclusion. They have not seen the light from the Bible. And when they see the light from the Bible, that we shall worship God on the day that He has introduced as a day of worship, they want to be loyal to God. And if they want to be loyal to God, they will have problems, they will not have the right to, to sell and buy, and they will, it, will be, it will be made a law to kill these people. Because they are standing against the new world order of the papacy. And he wants to have loyal people under his command. In Isaiah chapter 16 we read, Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. So we have to arise and shine and give this message, and we we, sh we shall be inspired by this because we are living in the last part of the world history. And when God is with us, even though they will try to take our lives, as long as Christ sees that we have a mission to give for Him, He will protect us and help us. As the angel's message swells into a loud cry, cry great power and glory will attend its proclamation. The faces of God's people will shine with the light of heaven. Servants of God with their faces lighted up and shining with holy consecration will hasten from place to place to proclaim the message from heaven. By thousands of voices all over the earth, the warning will be given. The papacy will try to hinder this proclamation. But God will go with his servants, so the message will be given. And the people have to take the stand. Many of faith and prayer will be constrained to go forth with holy seal, declaring the words which God gives them. The sins of Babylon will be laid open. The inroads of spiritualism the stealthy but rapid progress of the papal power, all will be unmasked. By these solemn warnings the people will be stirred. Thousands upon thousands will listen who have never heard words like this. Therefore he, the papacy, will go forth with great fury to destroy and utterly to make away many. And then Ellen White I think this person was used of God to really to write about this end time prophecy. She is writing, Many will be imprisoned, and many will free from their lives from cities to s and towns, and many will be martyrs for Christ's sake in standing in defense of 
the truth. And when we read this, we are reminded back to the Middle Ages, to the Waldenses, that had to flee to the mountains because the papacy, they wanted to kill them because they, they um, stood forward with the word of God. And today, we know that the papacy, he tried to introduce, as we have told, the new world order. And he will use word through all the institutions in the world as are willing to go together with, her, with the papacy in this goal. In the warfare to be waged in the last days, all the corrupt powers that do not show obedience to the law of God will unite in opposition to Christ and those who are standing on his side. The church will receive help from the governments. They will counsel together and unite to enforce and exalt the papacy's false day of rest Sunday. Contrary to the biblical day of rest, the fourth commandment of the Bible. The Sabbath commandment will thus be the great point of issue. Because in it the great lawmaker identifies himself as the creator of heaven and earth. So it will be a global test if you will worship God as the creator or if you will worship the beast and take its mark. All will be tested. But people shall be born. They shall, the preaching shall be given so all will understand what this is about. The mark of the beast, to worship the mark of the beast, to be loyal to the, to the papacy and the fallen Protestant churches, or if they shall be loyal to God. I hope that you are willing to follow God's authority. I hope that you are willing to follow Christ. Because we have read that all these powers, they are working against, they have war against Christ. And his followers. And then this message, they end in this conclusion. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. We have to, to hold out. We have to endure, to be patient. And we have to keep the commandments of God and have the faith. Of Jesus. And then we come to the last verse, to verse 45 in Daniel chapter 11. And he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas in the glorious holy mountain. Yet he shall come to his end and none shall help him. And I must admit that come to his end and none shall help him. So the Bible also reveals how it will go with the papacy in the last part of world history. They think that they will uh, win this battle about to introduce a new world order. But God has another plan to introduce his new world order. And it is God's plan that will be the plan that will that will uh, give victory. But now we shall see how it will go in with the papacy. And I hope that many Catholics and fallen Protestants and others will listen to these words from the Bible. From Revelation 17 verse 16. And the ten horns with which you saw on the beast, these will hate the harlot, make her desolate and naked, eat her flesh and burn, burn her with fire. At first the people admire the harlot, but when they understand that they have been that they have been deceived by the harlot, they will kill the harlot. And we continue to read in Revelation 18 verse 4 to 8. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, 
that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not her place. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her in iniquities. Reward her even as she rewarded you, and double into her double according to her works. In the cup which she hath filled, fill to the double. How much she has glorified herself, and lived deliciously, so much torment and sorrow give her. For she said in her heart, I sit a queen, and I am no widow, and shall see no sorrow. Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judges her. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet, that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire, burning with brimstone. So we see how it's going with the papacy, and all that is, that is going together with the papacy. They will end in the lake of fire. And then we read about the victory in Revelation chapter 15 verse 2. And I saw as it were a sea of glass mingled with fire. And them that had gotten the victory over the beast and over the image and over his mark and over the number of his name stand on the sea of glass having the harps of God. So the people of God, they have been in a battle in the last part of world history. They have been in a battle against the beast, the mark of the beast, the image of the beast, and the number of his name. And they have, gone, they have, they have gotten victory over the beast and the image of the beast, and the mark of the beast, and so on. And they stood saved in the kingdom of God. We are living in the last part of this dream that Nebuchadnezzar had, had when he saw this statue that had a head of gold, uh, a breast of uh, uh, silver, and a, and a hip of uh, bronze and legs of iron and then in the feet it was iron and clay and we are living in this last part in the feet in the foot and perhaps in the feet of this statue and the Bible is saying it will be ten kings they will work against Christ and they will try to establish their world power in this earth and Christ will let them do thy work, but just to, to let the world see the evil deeds, what they are doing. And at last, when all is revealed, that what Satan is doing through his agents, Christ will come and stop all this. Because Nebuchadnezzar, he saw a stone coming from heaven and hit the feet of the statue. And all the nations was ruined. And the stone was the stone of Christ. It was his kingdom that will be revealed. Christ is the rock, as we read it from 1 Corinthians 10, 4. And he said to the, he, Christ said to the Jews, Therefore I say unto you, The kingdom of God shall be taken from you, and given to a nation, being, bringing forth the fruits thereof. And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken. But on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grain him to power. It is up to you and me if we will fall upon this stone. If we will fall upon Christ. If not, the stone will fall upon us. 
It is your choice. It is my choice. We have a short time. No, we are living in the end time. And the prophecies in the Bible will be fulfilled. Christ will soon come back again. And we have to take a choice. Will we submit to these world powers? Or we will, if, if, will we submit to Christ and accept His salvation? You have to take a clear stand. You cannot stand with one foot in the world and one foot in the Bible. We have to take a clear stand for Christ or a clean, clear stand for the world. But we know the result. It is Christ and the people that will stand on His side that will be the victorious one. We have to take the decision here in our brain. If, and we have to use this center this center where we shall take conclusions, where we shall choose. And we have to take a clear stand for Christ or for the world. Christ is standing there with his hands, waiting for us to accept his call of mercy. He has done all to save us. And why should we not be thankful to him what he has done for us? He has a better place for us. And if we humble ourselves and accept his salvation, we will be his people and he will protect us and we will inherit the kingdom of God. May you and me use this time to purify ourselves so we can be clean in heart. We read this text from Malachi chapter 3, but who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire, and like launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. Today is the time of purification. Today is the shaking time. It is no we have to take a stand for Christ. Because soon the time of purification will end. And Christ will come back again. Do you want to be purified by him? Or do you want to be filthy and lose eternal life? The choice is yours and mine. The prophecies is being fulfilled. And we see that we are living in the end time. And Christ will soon come back again. Let us be ready for his second coming. We will end with a prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that you have revealed what will happen in the last time of this world history. We do not understand so much about what is happening, but we are so thankful for your word and we can read there. And as time is going on, we understand more and more of these prophecies. And we pray that you must help us, each one of us, so we can take time. That we can humble ourselves and be ready when you soon come back again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.